Now I'm excited to have this opportunity to be in your homes and in your hearts and to share the infallible Word of God with you. I'm going to start teaching something uh, tonight that I believe is going to flow over into next Sunday. And there's going to be a connecting point between these two texts that I believe is going to be relevant in your life. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. And there we're going to have an honest, deep, intrinsic conversation uh, as the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And he shares a very transparent but yet transformative moment in his life that I pray would be a blessing and most of all give comfort to you and, and strength to you. I, I, I find it uh, almost at the apex of scriptures I use to understand my own struggles and adversities and the vicissitudes of life that come against me. It has been a fortress to me and great strength to me and I'm happy to teach uh, on it today. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and we already know that the church at Corinth is not a very mature church, that they are uh, filled with the gifts of the Spirit, but they still have a great deal of carnality. Uh, they're kind of caught betwixt and between these two different uh, states of being. On one hand, they're prophesying and they're speaking in tongues and they're operating in the gifts, but they have not yet been refined to have the order and the infrastructure that's necessary to be adept at the gifts and then they have a propensity to be carnal. And this, this dichotomy of experiences makes Corinth a very good text for us to draw from because many of us today have such contradictions in our own lives. So you could take out Corinthians and put in contradictions because the church at Corinth was full of contradictions, to be honest. Uh, all of us have some contradictions in our lives and areas in our lives that, that we need to develop and grow in. And don't let anybody fool you and come in and speak to you in such a way that they make you think that somehow they have graduated from contradictions. There are contradictions in all of our lives that keep us at the feet of Jesus. Uh, lest the mercy of God be wasted. And the Bible says the mercies of God are new every morning. Why would he renew mercy that you don't need because you're, you're just so perfect you don't need the mercies of God? Truth of the, morning, you, truth of the matter is you need mercy every day. Yeah. Yes, sir. You need mercy every day. You want to minimize the contradictions as much as possible, but there's still contradictions in your life and things that you struggle with and things that struggle with you and things that pull at you and things that uh, would, would desire to take you under. And they're not always the kinds of sins that people want to talk about, though there are those too. There are those, absolutely, absolutely, sins of the flesh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life, all of that is a part of it, and all the things that come out of those three categories are all parts. See, all that is in the world is three things, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's all there is. All these other things, adultery, whoremongering, lying, cheating, all of that are subcategories up under those three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. It may not be any of those things that the church likes to focus on. You might struggle with depression. You might struggle with insecurity. You might struggle, but everybody has a certain amount of struggle. You would not think, because of the way we have a way of esteeming leaders, you would not think that the Apostle Paul has had uh, any such struggles. But here in the text, he says some interesting things. And I'm going to start at the first verse and then we'll go down. Are you with me? All right. He starts by uh, salutations. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, whenever Paul says that he is an apostle by the will of God, it's always a sticky reminder that he did not become an apostle through the will of the other apostles. He was not highly favored amongst the other apostles. They feared him. Some resented him. Uh, some revered him. He was, he was chosen to be an apostle by the will of God. And uh, that, that just the very introduction of the chapter kind of sets you up into a context of understanding that, that he has not enjoyed the benefit of the favor of all of those he worked beside. Uh, and it's important that you understand that because some of you are so preoccupied with your haters that you never get anything done. You're, you're so focused on who resents you and who didn't like you and who didn't support you. Well, Paul said, oh, that's nothing. I'm an apostle by the will of God. 
And Timothy, our brother, unto the church. And so he also acknowledges that he has Timothy, uh, our brother, who is really his spiritual son, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Blessed be God. First of all, that, that God is fully equipped with every blessing. Blessed be God. If you don't understand that God is blessed, you'll never understand how you can be blessed. You, you have to realize that Paul almost is insistent in almost every greeting as referring to God as being blessed. Blessed be God, he said later, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and things that pertain unto life and godliness in Christ Jesus. But he's always extolled God as being blessed. He, is, he doesn't see God as impotent or powerless or insignificant or insecure or powerless or in need of anything. He esteems God high enough. When you start esteeming God high enough, your problems will get low enough that you can see him in a different light. Some people's God is too small to take on the challenge. That's not to say God is small, but their concept of God is too small. He says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Oh, God, the Father of mercies. And if you're taking notes, you want to you hone in on the blessed God is still the Father of mercies. He's, he's full of power, full of authority. He is omnipotent. Okay, he is sovereign, he is absolute. He doesn't have to meet with the board or committee. He has absolute autonomy and control and power over our affairs. So he could be blessed and not be merciful. So he graduates in his understanding of God from talking about the blessed God and then now refers to him as the father of mercies. That's who you're praying to, the father of mercies. Okay, every mercy that's ever been executed in your life, implemented in your life, applied into your life, God fathered it. He is the father of mercies. And then he graduates again and says he is the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. Listen, see what I'm trying to get you to see is how Paul knows God, because that has a lot to do with how he writes about God, how he sees God, how he understands God. He has called him blessed. He has called him the father of mercies. And then he has called him the God of all comfort. Look at his relationship with God. Look at how he understands God in his life, okay? Who comforteth us in all, in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Now, first he talks about God comforts us that we might be able to emulate his comfort in the lives that we touch. I teach people about mentoring. I said, if I'm mentoring you as a pastor, just go back and do ye likewise. That's what Jesus taught the disciples, do ye likewise. In other words, there should not be a contamination from what I gave you to what you give them. A lot of times people who represent you don't represent you correctly. You will remember how God uh, destroyed Moses for misrepresenting him. Moses didn't go to the promised land because Moses was angry and smote the rock and he expressed an anger that was not of God. That's what happens in a lot of, of staff people. A lot of times you will have the right heart about it, but the people who represent you to other people don't have your heart about it and you get misrepresented. God shows us how to deal with that misrepresentation because he removed Moses for misrepresenting him. There should be a constant flow from the way God has comforted you in how you comfort people. From the way God forgives you to the way you forgive people. From the way God is merciful to you to how you're merciful to other people. You don't want that comfort and that mercy to be the blessing, the comfort, or the mercy to be diluted or polluted, okay? We've talked about the blessings of God. We've talked about him being the father of mercies. We've talked about him being the God of all comfort. Then Paul says, who comforteth us in all of our uh, infirmities. That say, it's one thing for him to be the God of all comfort, but that doesn't help me if he doesn't comfort me. 
Okay, you can be something, you can be rich, but that doesn't help me if you don't give it to me. You, if, the only way I can benefit is if you communicate the comfort. So here the God who is the God of all comfort now communicates comfort to us. But the challenge is for you to then comfort other people in the same way that God comforts you. That's always been my challenge as a minister. I have never preached against another pastor, preached against them or in competition to them is what I mean. I'm never worried about who preached before me or who preached after me. I'm never competing against them. I'm competing against the voice within because the voice that preaches in me is so much better than the voice that preaches out of me <laughs> that it's hard for me to walk away feeling good about it because the voice I hear is so much better than the voice I speak that I'm racing against the voice I hear to communicate effectively. You understand? Oh, I just gave you a nugget right there. See, what you want to do, you don't want to race against other people. You want to race against your revelation of God in you. So, so if God comforted you, if God brought you through something, if God was merciful to you, if God blessed you, you want to be able to bless them. If he didn't fuss at you, if he didn't bring up your sins, if he didn't condemn you, you don't want to then turn around and fuss at them and condemn them. Because when you do that, now write this down, you either dilute or pollute the comfort of God. And the art of being remaining in your station without being removed, Moses, is to allow what you receive to flow out of you without dilution or pollution, okay? The same way it came down, don't dilute anything or don't add anything which is to pollute so that you're like uh, Psalms 127, it is, behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that fell upon the head of Aaron onto his beards, onto his skirts, and then it ends up and says, there God commanded the blessing, talking about unity. Notice that the oil that falls upon the head is the same oil that falls upon the beard, is the same oil that falls upon the skirts. So all you have to do is be in alignment. That oil is not diluted or polluted. That same thought is what this text brings to life here, that the same God that comforts you is the same way you comfort other people. That's a big order right there. Yeah, it's huge because when you say, can't nobody do me like Jesus, I get that. But then the way Jesus did you ought to be the way you do me. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> you see, see that so, so you're not competing against other people. You're not responding to other people based on what they did to you. You're responding to other people out of the grace that God has given to you, the blessing God has given to you, the comfort God has given to you. So the more perilous times you have faced, the more grace you are to produce. The more, you understand what I'm saying? Isn't that good? The, the more you have experienced the comfort of God, the more that comfort needs to be duplicated and allocated in your life. That's why the Bible says, later in Corinthians, we'll talk about, uh, ye which are, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. Okay, that whole thing, considering yourself, is the same way God restored you, you ought to be able to restore them. If people would do other people like God did them, the world would be a better place. Okay, so this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about uh, you emitting the same comfort that you received. You release it the way you receive it. You give it the way it was given to you without diluting it without polluting it, no contingencies in the contract, straightforward, no chaser, just straight up, just acting like God. This is a principle of mentoring. So the first time you sit back, you watch me do it, okay? Then you do it with me, step two. Then step three, I do it with you. Step four, I watch you do it. Then by the time we get to step four, I'm ready to stand back. What I'm really basically doing then when I'm mentoring you is teaching you to do likewise, okay? So God is merciful to you that you might be merciful. God is comforting you that you might comfort. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, now, if you've never had to be comforted, that's why I'm scared of people who've never been through anything. 
because your revelation of God is a result of your experience with God. If you've had no experience with God, you have no real revelation with God, and you're, you're preaching the letter of the Word, but you miss the spirit of the Word because you haven't been a, a student of His mercy. You haven't been a recipient of His grace, and so you can be condescending and self-righteous and condemning and live on an island by yourself. But once you have messed up yourself, once you have gotten in trouble yourself, once you have insecurities yourself, once you have burdens yourself, it changes how you handle other people because you see yourself in the people you serve. You understand? Now, if you can't relate to that, you need, you need to get out of the ministry. You're not ready to minister yet. You're not ready to really do what God has called you to do until you've been in trouble <laughs> you're not ready to minister to people who are in trouble because you're not going to be compassionate because you haven't been a recipient of mercy. You haven't been a recipient of, gr of grace. You haven't been a recipient of comfort. And so you need to do likewise. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Okay. So blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all, not some, in all our tribulation. That, now, he didn't get us out of tribulation, but he comforted us in it. Remember that, because when I preach Sunday, that's going to really make, that's going to make sense to you. That we may be able to comfort them. He took us through it that we might be able to comfort them. Oh, God. Some of what you're going through is not even about you. The only reason God took you through it is so that you would be able to comfort them. Yeah. yeah. You're understanding, why me? Why did that happen to me, Lord? I don't deserve to go through this. This is not about you. This is so that you will be able to serve them. Whenever you make them more important than you, you're ready to be a minister. You're not ready to be a minister when it all roads lead to you and it's all about you. You can only minister, whether it's from the pulpit, whether it's from a music uh, place, whether it's from a piano, whether it's from ministering to somebody in the post office, you can only minister to the, de to the degree that you have been ministered to. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. So, so every minister ought to be a recovering something. Yeah. <laughs> a redeemed something, a restored something, a renewed something, because I'm scared to follow somebody who never failed. Yeah, because if I ever trip up and fall, they'll destroy me and think they did God's service. I need somebody. I'm not talking about a charlatan, a crook, a scandalous person, but I need somebody who has applied for mercy so that they will be able to allocate mercy in my own life. Are you hear what I'm saying? who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. He said, I went through some of everything so that I'd be able to comfort other people who are facing any trouble. Any trouble. That's a, that's a big order to feel right there. Are you following me? by the comfort wherewith ourselves are confident of God. He said, I didn't make up a different comfort for you than what I experienced. That I didn't pollute it. I didn't pollute it. I didn't add my version of it. I didn't put my spin on it. I'll forgive you, but I won't forget it. I'm going to loan you the money, but I'm going to tell you off. No, 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 no. The same way you received it is the same way you ought to give it. You ought to shout me down right there. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The sufferings of Christ abound in us. Isn't that something that he would say? Now, you see, a lot of the time people today, you suffer because of things you did. Yeah. You suffer because you're nasty. You suffer because your mouth talks too much. You suffer because you said things. That's not what he's talking about. I'm not saying God won't forgive you for that, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about suffering, the sufferings of Christ. They suffered for the name of the Lord. He said, for the sufferings, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, 
so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So he said, as the sufferings escalated, the consolation escalated. When the sufferings went higher, the consolation went higher. From faith to faith, from glory to glory, as I got to new levels, I fought new devils. As I fought new devils, I got to new levels. God's consolation abounded to me as a trigger switch from the attack that was on my life. Do you see what I'm saying? The greater the attack, the greater the glory. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. The greater the attack, the greater the glory. Let me say it this way. Where sin did abound, God did, grace did much more abound. The devil has never manufactured anything in hell that God did not do in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Every tongue that rises against you, God shall condemn. God will always outdo the enemy. I know you see the tear growing up, but the wheat is growing up right beside it. Glory to God. So as the tear comes up, the wheat comes up right beside it too. God is not going to be outdone in your life. That's good news for somebody. That's good news for somebody. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolations also abounded by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. He says, if I'm afflicted, I'm afflicted to make you better. Yeah. Okay, this is what it means to be given to the Lord, where God has given you as a gift to the body of Christ. That means your life is not your own. Your choices are not your own. The sufferings that you go through, not even for you, it's for other people. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We don't talk about this level of commitment, but we ought to. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering. He said, I took it better because I knew it was going to make me better with you. I withstood it. I didn't faint in it because I thought about you, okay? And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings. It, hate, it made me better in enduring the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Both in the suffering and the comforting, it is still for you. These are experiences that we had that we might be able to relate to you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go deeper. So I talked to a young pastor who uh, recently had a death in his family. He was traumatized by the death. He said, I will never be the same again. I said, yes, and you'll never do a funeral the same again. Because once you have been on this side of the casket, it affects how you function on that side of the casket. Until you've been on this side of the casket, you can, you can go to the funeral, remain detached from the funeral, go to lunch, go out laughing and going about your business. You're just doing a job. But when you empathize with the family, when you have sat where they sat, when you have been through what they've been through, there's another level of compassion that comes in your life. When you have been a patient, it makes you more patient with people when they're sick. When you have been through surgery, it changes how you handle people who have been through surgery. Don't, don't be too angry at people who haven't been through surgery and expect you to get up and run. They don't know any better. But once they go through it themselves, it will change everything. Don't be upset with people who are trying to rush you to cook dinner and they don't cook because they don't understand how long it takes to make anything. But once you have been the one who stood up for hours cooking yourself, it gives you another level of empathy with the person who is providing it. Experience does matter. When are we going to recognize that experience does matter? God doesn't just promote you because you want to be promoted and because you got a YouTube station and because you got some Facebook posts and because you got some followers and because you got some friends on Facebook. God is not counting your friends to promote you. God promotes you after you have suffered a while. The Bible said, after you've suffered a while, I'll establish you and make you perfect. God doesn't care anything. He can give you followers at any point. God has given you experiences right now to prepare you to be trusted with followers. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, this is good. Okay, and, and where am I? And whether we be afflicted is for your consolation, salvation, which is effectual and enduring of the same suffering, which also we suffer, whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast. Our hope of you is steadfast, knowing 
that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. He said, I have this hope for you that if you have suffered with us, you will be Console with us. You'll be comforted with us. God won't let you be a partaker of the suffering and not be a partaker of the consolation. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? If he has trusted you with the pain, he's going to trust you with the power. If he trusted you with the rain, he's going to trust you with the sunshine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's coming. You might be in one part of it right now, but the, but the balance, balance is coming in your life. Balance is the epitome of maturity. I'm going to say that again. Balance is the epitome of maturity. It won't be all suffering and no consolation. It won't be all consolation and no suffering. God will balance your life. He won't give you revelation like Paul and then not put a thorn in your flesh to balance you lest you be exalted above measure. God said, I'm not going to let it all be one-sided. I'm not going to let you have all good and no problem. Do you think you were going to build that church and not come under any kind of attack? No, God is going to balance you. Do you, on the other hand, do you think you're going to have all attack and not have greater power? No. The more you're up under attack, the more the anointing is being produced in your life to respond to the attack in your life. Oh, my God, do you hear what I'm saying? God is going to give you balance. Maturity is balance. Whenever you deal with somebody who's out of balance, they're immature. They don't mean any harm. They're just out of balance. As you come into full maturity, you become more balanced. Balanced in your thinking, balanced in your judgment, balanced in your preaching, balanced in your discernment, balanced in your attitude, balance in your life. Equally applied on both sides, north to south, east to west, God gives you balance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You ought to pray, Lord, balance me. Because if God doesn't balance you and you have all success and no trial, you won't be able to sustain the success. I'm able to sustain, not because of success, but because of suffering. Somebody asked me, was it difficult for me to preach in a church with very few people? I said, no, I cut my teeth on that. Didn't it? Now, had I inherited the church, it might throw me for a loop. But because I started with zero, you didn't do nothing but put me in my natural habitat. I don't have to have a crowd of people dancing all around me to preach the Word of God. The Word of God will make its own gravy. It'll stand all by itself. It's true if don't nobody say, oh, hallelujah. It's true if don't nobody say amen. It's true if nobody hollers. It's true if nobody responds. And God will allow you to come up the hard way so that you'll be strong enough to hold on to what he's given to you in your life. And the Lord hid me on the backside of the mountains of West Virginia for almost 20 years before he sent me to Dallas so I would have balance in my life. Had I received what I got in Dallas without going through what I went through in West Virginia, I'd be walking around with my chest stuck out. But I know what it is to preach to 50 people. I know what it is to preach to 12 people and two of them asleep. I know what it is to have to pay the rent to keep the church open. God will give you balance. So don't despise the day of small beginnings because God is balancing you. And you that have been successful, don't you get caught up in your success and get arrogant because one thing can happen and it can all go away. One little thing, one little virus, one little attack, one little storm, one little war, one little rumor, one little adversity, and it can all go away. Everything, everything, the house, the car, everything can go away. Everybody wants to be with you when things are going well. But when things get bad, they will all walk away and, and leave you. Don't miss Sunday's message because I'm going to talk about just that you're going to really be blessed by it. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Now, and this is where it really good, gets good to me about verse 8. For we would, would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. A lot of people want you to think that they don't go through anything. They want you to be ignorant of their trouble. They want you to think that they walk around in clouds and they're so spiritual. I never will forget when I was a young pastor, I was pastoring, a young man came to my house. He's walking around in my house. He said, Pastor, he said, I'm kind of disappointed. I said, what are you disappointed about, brother? He said, 
I don't know. He said, I kind of thought your house would be different. He said, I kind of thought there'd be some prayer altars in the living room and a cross up on the wall and Mahalia Jackson or somebody singing in the house all the time. I said, I got all of that at church, <laughs> okay? So I want to have life and balance, you understand? It, 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 and people have certain expectations of you. I said, now, do you have that going in your house? Yeah. No, Pastor. I said, well, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. So, so I don't want you to be ignorant of my trouble. I don't want you to think that I float in the air, that I cannot be touched by your infirmity. Paul said, I want you to understand that even though I am an apostle and even though I'm writing letters that will be included later into the holy writ of God's word, I still had trouble. Now, if the guy who wrote the Bible had trouble, you know those of us who preach it are going to have trouble. Come on, somebody. He says, I would not have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of men. He said, when I went to Asia, I was pressured in a way like I have never experienced before. This is Paul, baby. He's been stoned. He's been left for dead. He's been shipwrecked. This isn't no wuss talking here. When he talks about pressure, we have to respect Paul's ability to endure pressure. But he says, I was pressed above measure. Now we're getting down to some really good stuff. Does the word of God speak to people who are stressed out? Absolutely. Does the word of God speak to people who are depressed? Absolutely. Does the word of God speak to people who are being affected by external circumstances to the point that they're about to implode internally? Absolutely. That's why we're looking at this text tonight. Because this text admits flamboyantly that the writer of this epistle after all of this word about comfort and all of this word about ministering to other people, he now comes down and says, I myself, when I went through Asia, was pressed. He said, I couldn't even calculate or quantify what it felt like to be me. Do you, is there somebody watching me right now who's going through something and part of the pain of what you're going through is feeling like nobody knows what it's like to be you? That, that, that there is no measurement, there is no ability to quantify the amount of stress you're under. I'm so glad you're tuned in to this Bible class. I'm so glad you're watching me right now because I have a word for you. There is a pressure that is above measure that you cannot calculate, that makes you feel like you're going to explode, that makes you feel like you cannot survive, that makes you despair of life itself. And that pressure doesn't just come to sinners. And it doesn't just come to people who don't know the word. And it doesn't just come to people who are living ungodly. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, is writing. And in spite of him being an apostle, in spite of the fact he was chosen, in spite of the fact that he is responsible for writing more epistles than any other person in the New Testament, says, I was discouraged. I was at my wit's end. I know that Jesus appeared to me on the road to Damascus, knocked me off the horse. I had amazing testimony, great encounter. I won all kinds of souls for Jesus. He said, but when I went through this period in my life, I was discouraged. I was pressed above measure. And then he goes on, let me see, I want to read it because I could quote it, but I, I don't want to miss anything. Okay. Uh, have you eaten it or a truck came out said, that we were pressed out of measure and above strength. Now, it's one thing to be pressed above measure. We can't quantify the pressure. He said, but the pressure was also beyond my strength. It, this was too much for me. I want to talk about too much. It's, it's not always allocated according to your strength. Sometimes your pressure exceeds your ability. If it didn't, why would you need God? That I can't handle it, that breaking point, that tipping point, that edge. Somebody's at that point right now. You're watching me right now, and you're saying, my God, it feels like he's talking right to me. I am. I'm talking right to you right now. 
And you say, I can't handle it. I know. I get it. It's beyond my strength. I can't. This is too much for me. Why do you think he said, cast all your cares on me because I care for you? He said, you got to cast it on me because you can't handle it. Watch this. The apostle is saying, it was beyond my strength. It hit me so hard, I didn't have an answer. I could not handle it. So stop beating yourself up because you can't handle it. Beating yourself up because you don't have an answer. And most importantly, beating yourself up because you can't fix it. There are some problems you cannot fix. There are some mountains you cannot move. Oh, this is not popular. There are some things that happen in your life that all you can do is tuck your head down and go through it the best way you can because it's too much for you to bear. The writer here says, I could not handle it. It was too much for me. It was above, it was, I was pressed out of measure, above strength. Here's the, here's the shocking part. In so much that I despaired of life itself. I was so pressured, I wanted to die. Now, now listen, friend. If, if, if the gentleman who's writing the scripture says, I know what it is to be pressured so bad that I wanted to die. Then the rest of us jokers who are reading the scriptures, surely we have gone through some moments. I, I, whether you talk about it or not or tell anybody about it or not or admit to it or not, I know it'll mess up your resume. I know you want everybody to think you're Superman, that you don't have a Clark Kent, but there are moments in your life that your cape doesn't fit anymore and your boots hurt your feet and you have to admit, I am not Superman. This is too much for me. I cannot handle this. I'm pressed above measure. I can't even articulate or count or explain to anybody how bad this is and it is beyond my strength. Thank you, Lord. And how do you know it's beyond your strength? Because now I'm despairing of life. It, that means the pressure on the outside has gotten so on the inside that the apostle Paul, we're not talking about snidely whiplash here. This is the apostle Paul. Says I, he's writing the New Testament and he is admitting that I went through something coming out of Asia that made me want to die. The hardest thing in the world for a Christian is to admit that they felt like that. Because we feel like we make God look bad if we went through a period in our lives of forlornment. We don't want anybody to know it. So when people ask you, how you doing? I'm blessed in the Lord, thank God in you. You know, we got all of those Christian colloquialisms. Oh, child, I'm blessed and highly favored. Glory to God, hallelujah. And we're going down the road because we know what we're supposed to say. But I'm talking about when how you feel doesn't line up with what you are supposed to say. There are moments in your life that you cannot really tell people how you really feel because they couldn't handle it. They see you as invincible. You're super mom. You're super mama. You're super daddy. You, you always got it together. We, we always call on you. You're the wonder woman of our family. You are the hulk of our house. We always call on you, and they don't know that even the hulk gets tired. Don't call me. Because I'm right at the edge. And Paul says, I despaired of life itself. Have you ever had something hurt you so bad you wanted to die? That's a question. I'm asking you, have you ever had something hurt you so bad that you wanted to die? We feel saved, Holy Ghost feel, talking in tongues, uh, God, uh, going on in Jesus' name, self, and secretly you went through something, and I think the, the secrecy is worse than the thing itself. We have something going on with us as a people in a culture that we don't like to talk about things that overwhelm us. 
So we want to act like we got it all together all the time, and yet we've got mental health issues out of control. Suicides are breaking out, particularly amongst African American children, in epidemic rates. And as long as we get our dance in on Sunday, we think everything is okay. This is not about you getting your dance in. This is not about where rather than flip flat hooped at the end of the message, change keys 12 times. He can change keys a hundred times, and you still want to die. You can dance all over the church and get in the car and that same spirit will be waiting on you in the car and follow you back to the house and you go home in agony and the worst part is you can't even tell anybody. But if Paul outed that devil and said he got on me so bad I wanted to die, then you don't have to be ashamed to say I'm dealing with depression I'm fighting with suicide and I feel like it's beyond my strength and it's beyond my capacity. Did you know that the Bible has a word for people who are suicidal? Do you know that God has a word for people who are depressed? Do you know that God has a word for people who are stressed out and feel like I cannot handle it? These kids are driving me crazy. The kids, the bills, the storms, the job, the problems have all overwhelmed me. And they're angry and they're frustrated. And depression is really just anger turned inside. Yeah, depressed people are people who have swallowed so much anger that the anger has started attacking their emotions. And if you don't resolve it, it will attack your body. I want to talk to some angry men out there. That's not to say that women aren't equally angry, but we have a propensity to, to interpret all of life's pain in the language of anger. Because anger is an acceptable emotion for a man to have. We get to be mad. We don't get to burst into tears and collapse on people. We get to be angry. So even though we are hurt bad enough to burst into tears and collapse on somebody, we convert the pain into anger because anger seems more comfortable to who we are, not knowing that the anger is poison. And we end up in a state of depression we end up in a state of depression and we feel like dying because anger has turned inside of us. Paul said, it got to me. It got to me. I want to tell you, man, I want you to hear me clearly, young lady. I want, to hear, I want you to hear me and I want you to understand that this Bible is not ignoring you. It speaks right to the continuity of what you're going through right now. And the Apostle Paul is telling us, I went through a period I wanted to die. I was preaching suicidal. I was teaching suicidal, singing in the choir, suicidal, clapping my hands, beating my tambourine, suicidal, laying hands on people, people getting healed. And I'm so I went through something where I despaired of life itself. I wasn't asking God to fix it. I just wanted him to take me out. Yeah. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of being hurt. I'm tired of being misunderstood. I'm tired of being confused. I'm tired of having problems. I despaired of life itself. Can you be honest? Can you open up? Can we have a real conversation about pressure? Just you and me having a real conversation Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes a blessing can be too much. <laughs> I pray all the time, Lord, don't give me anything that's too much for me. Even if it's good and you see I can't handle it, don't, don't give me something I can't handle. You, it is possible to have a blessing you don't have the capacity to receive. Stop asking for other people's stuff. You don't know what comes with that. You don't know what comes with that opportunity. You don't know what comes with that position. You don't know what comes with that woman. You don't know what comes with them kids. You don't want everything you see everybody else got. You can't handle it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stop volunteering for everything to be a dumpster for everybody to dump into. Cut the phone off. Yes. Go to bed. Some things are just too much until we can talk about those places in our lives where we're overwhelmed, we won't really have a great ministry. 
great ministries are places where you can have great honesty and you can have great transparency and say, look, man, Paul says, I despaired of life itself. Now, had Paul been preaching today, we probably would have defrocked him. <laughs> we, we would have defrocked him. There are not many preachers, pastors, bishops, teachers who want to get up and say, church, I'm going to preach this morning, but I'm a little suicidal. Can you imagine getting up on Sunday morning, good morning, Paul's house. I'm suicidal today, but I'm going to bring the word. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going through something I despair of life. I don't want to live, but I'm going to run this revival because I know how to run a revival. And I, hallelujah. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care how you hoop. There are times in your life that your gift is saying one thing, but your personhood is saying something else. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You, you? A person who can do something can do it, but just because you can do it doesn't mean that you are it. You see, I can paint a beautiful picture, but that doesn't mean that my life is beautiful. If I can paint, I can just paint it. I can paint because I can paint. If I can act, I can act. If I can sing, I can sing. If I can preach, I can preach. That has nothing to do with me. That's the gift he gave me. It is possible. In fact, people love to come get your gift and leave you. Oh, y'all ain't going to shout. I'm going to shout now. I'm going to shout for myself. I'm going to shout. I'm going to shout for myself because I know what it is to have. People adore what you have to offer. <laughs> oh, they love what you have to offer, but they don't give two cents about you. Paul said, I despair the life itself. Now, there's not a pastor in the country who could safely get up on Sunday morning and say, y'all, open your Bibles. I'm going to Corinthians. I'm going to preach the Word of God today. But just as a footnote, pray for me. I'm a little suicidal. I'm kind of depressed. I'm on the edge. I might flip out at any time because it's too much on me right now. But uh, I'm going to preach this Word. Service me out. It'd be over. Everybody be gone. And yet, that's what the apostle is saying in the text he said, I didn't want to live anymore. Can, can I go a little bit deeper? He said, we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we pressed. Now, pressed out of measure is, is pressure from the outside. You see, that pressure is coming from outside circumstances. Sometimes you can be pressed so many different ways I told my wife the other day, I came back to the room to go to bed. I said, do you not know in the last three hours, I have been on the phone with 10 people. One of them I had to get rushed to the emergency room. The other one I was confident because somebody died. The other one I was in the middle of a fight between the husband and his wife. I said, all of this happened in the last three hours. I said, I went to bed, not because I was sleepy. I just didn't want nobody else to call. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't call. No more today. I'll take the rest of it in the morning. No more today. You have to know when too much is too much. It's too much. They're going to be all right till morning. You're not God. Paul says it's too much for me. I'm the spirit of life. It got too much for me. It got too much for me. It got too much. I think sometimes when you love people, you don't want to disappoint them, and so you don't know when to say enough. You know how the waitress will come to you and she'll start pouring coffee or something or sprinkling pepper on your salad and say, say when? And, 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 and sometimes we don't know how to say when. That's enough. Thank you. That's it. We don't know how to get out of it. So we are pressed above measure and beyond strength. And everything is so important that we don't let anybody down. And all the while we are going down. Okay. Now I'm going to summarize with this. He said, but we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. He said, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Hello, I felt like dying, so I knew not to trust me. 
Oh, God. Hallelujah. I went through this period that was too much for me so that I would not be walking around counting on my own power. This is not about willpower. This is not about pain tolerance. He said, I went through this so that I would not trust myself. Good God Almighty. This is good enough for me to get my own taste. I will not trust myself. I could not. We had the sentence of death working in ourselves so we would not trust ourselves. Are you taking on so much and trusting yourself more than you should? You handle everything. You don't delegate anything. You don't, are you trusting in yourself more than you should? Come on, this is getting good. And then he says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He said, we, we're going to trust in God who raised, I'm suicidal, but I'm preaching this morning. We're going to trust in God who raises the dead. He's going to raise me. He raises people who did die. I, if he raises the dead, he can raise somebody who's feeling like that. Oh, you don't hear me. I got good news for you. Get ready for a resurrection to happen in your life. Get ready for a resurrection to happen in your spirit. Get ready for a renewal to come into your heart because God raises the dead. If he raises the dead, he raises people who feel like dying and raises people who feel like quitting and raises people who are at their wit's end. Are you with me? Yes, sir. I say, are you with me? Yes, sir. I say, are you with me? Yes, sir. I say, are you with me? Yes, I say, are you with me? Yes, there are three things that he teaches us in the 10th verse about God. I'm going to give you these three things and I'll be gone. These are three-dimensional, uh, it's a three-dimensional understanding, 3D understanding of God that he doesn't drop on us to the 10th verse, but it is powerful and you need to know it and you need to understand it. It is a three-dimensional comprehensive understanding of the delivering power of God. Hallelujah. Shout, he will deliver me. Glory to God. You're absolutely right. Shout, he hath delivered me. Shout, he will deliver me. You're right on both hands. Both of those things are two different things working at the same time. He hath delivered me. He is delivering me. He shall deliver me. This is a three-dimensional understanding of God. He hath delivered me. I'm delivered right now. I am delivered right now. My life is hid in Christ with God. My sins are remitted. I'm delivered. I'm saved. Past tense. It's complete. It's finished. It's done. Hallelujah. It is finished. It is done. It is history, devil. You should have killed me when you had the chance. It's too late. It's over. It's done. It's set aside. It's finished. Hallelujah. When Jesus got up, I got up with him. It's over. He has delivered me. That's, you got to settle that part. If you don't know that, you're, you, that you are saved and that you are delivered past tense, that it is finished, that it is irrevocable, that it is immutable, that it is unchangeable, that it is done by the power of God and not by the power of Jake's, if you don't know that, you won't be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. You got to be able to throw Jesus up in the devil's face and say, he has delivered me. It might not look like it. I might not feel like it. I might not see it. I might not understand it. He has delivered me. Hallelujah. I thank God for, for my early childhood teaching and my understanding of justification and understanding that I am justified by faith. He has delivered me. That's over. A lot of people have never graduated to understanding that their deliverance is done not by what they did or don't do anymore, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ, he has delivered me. It's over. That's past tense. It's settled. It's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. It's not up for you to vote on it. What you say about me doesn't have anything to do with it. He has delivered me. Oh, that's good news. That's good news. That's why you're saved. That's why you're Christian. That's what it means to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. He hath delivered me. Thank you, Father. 
And then he goes on, on the premise of understanding that I have been delivered. So you can't get out of that first grade, that first grade teaching that I have been delivered. If you're not settled on that, you're not ready to graduate to the next class. So you got to understand, I have been delivered. That's over, that's settled, that's finished, that's done, that's complete, that's over, it's mine. I have possessed it. It is a reality. I am saved. Hallelujah. I'm saved. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, I am saved. Not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did, I am saved. I'm a recipient. I'm an heir of salvation. This is my story. This is my soul. Praising my Savior all the day long. Are you with me? I said, are you with me? Ain't no need to sit here if you ain't going to be with me. I said, are you with me? Now, let's settle that. Let's settle that. Because we can't graduate if we can't settle, he had delivered. So you got to know that. You got to know that. It's not important that other people believe that. You have to know that for yourself. He hath delivered me. That's done. That's not up for debate. Devil can't have that. Witch can't have that. Spell can't do that. Trouble can't take that. I am delivered. And yet he takes us to the second step. You ready to go to the second step? Because this is three-dimensional. So let's go to the second dimension. The second dimension is he doth deliver. While I am delivered, I am yet being delivered. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You see, I am delivered. That's past tense. That's historical. That is my standing. That is my, sta that is my state. That is my position. I am delivered. My life is hid in Christ with God. That is my position in him. And yet I am being. I am being. The God who hath delivered me is yet delivering me. So he has delivered me in terms of my position, but he is delivering me in terms of my condition. Uh, come on, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. He hath delivered me according to my position. He doth deliver me in terms of my condition. Okay, so the God who hath delivered me, he purchased me. He bought me out of the marketplace. My life is hid in Christ with God. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm in the finished work of Christ, and yet in my conditions, I am being delivered. That's why he gave me the Holy Spirit to work in this present world to continue the deliverance process in my conditions. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to continue to work on my position. When Christ said, tell Telestai, it is finished, that settled my position. The Holy Spirit came to deliver my conditions so that there is equity between my conditions and my position. Okay, are you following what I'm saying? So he doth deliver, he hath delivered, he is doth deliver, he is delivering. So right now I am being delivered, I have been delivered, I am being delivered. Let me stay, stay there just a minute or two. The progressive regeneration of the soul is an ongoing process. So even though I have been redeemed positionally, and I am still being redeemed conditionally, my conditions don't always reflect my position. That is a progressive, ongoing relationship that continues to exist between me and Jesus. Am I teaching good? Are you getting anything out of this? I am being delivered. You ought to get something out of it because it's true. It's true about you. You can't sit there and act like you don't know this because that's true in your life. You are saved, yet you are being saved. You are delivered, yet you are being delivered. You are free, yet you are being liberated. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Unless you have been translated, you are still in process. Even though your, condition, your position is finished, you are still in process as an individual. And so he said, he hath delivered, he doth deliver, he doth deliver. 
oh, thank you, Jesus. Whatever is going to face me tomorrow, I'm happy to know that he does deliver. <laughs> Whatever I'm going to go through next week, it's good to know, April, he does deliver. It, what, whatever my family is going through, whatever my finances are going through, whatever I'm going through in my body, my emotions, my flesh, he does deliver. Okay? And so we are here right now in, in the, the being delivered stage from God. We're being delivered. We're being delivered. We're being delivered. Every time the enemy thinks he's got me, I'm being delivered. Every time I'm backed in a corner, I'm being delivered. Every time I'm stressed out, I'm being delivered. To those of you who we were just talking to who are pressed above measure and beyond strength, this is the good news. God is getting ready to deliver you. Paul didn't stay like he was. He didn't stay depressed. He didn't stay suicidal. He didn't stay at his wit's end. He didn't stay there because God continues to deliver us. We are renewed. He is the father of mercies. He got new mercy. He got a mercy for money. Monday, a mercy for Tuesday, a mercy for Wednesday, a mercy for Thursday, a mercy for Friday. Whatever Saturday he's got for you, God's got a mercy for that to give us this day, our daily bread. As my days are, so shall my strength be. God continues to deliver us. So he's not finished with me. Though I have been delivered, yet he doth deliver. And then he goes into the, this is the third dimension, I shall be delivered. I have been delivered from the penalty of sin. That's over. I have been delivered from the penalty of sin. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I've been delivered from the penalty of sin. Okay. I am being delivered from the habit of sin. <laughs> I am being delivered. I have been delivered from the penalty. I am being delivered from the habit of sin. I shall be delivered from the presence of sin. Okay. This is the blessed hope of the church that we shall be delivered from the very presence of sin. Right now we're being delivered from the habit of sin. On the Calvary we were delivered from the penalty of sin. This is a three-dimensional deliverance that occurs in the life of every believer. Now I'm going to test you. I, where, where are we back here? Has been delivered. I've been delivered from what? The penalty of sin. Where are we right here? I'm being delivered. He does deliver. What am I being delivered from? The habit of sin. What's up ahead of me? He will be delivered. Will be deliver me from what? The, from the presence of sin. That's what it is to be caught up to meet the Lord. That's what it is to be absent in the body and be present with the Lord. That's what happened to your grandmother. That's what happened to your mother. That's what happened to your grandfather. They were delivered from the presence of sin. Hallelujah. Caught up to meet him. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my God. I felt that down in my soul. He delivered me from the presence of sin. That is the blessed hope of the church. Three dimensions. So, so tonight, you can say I went through a three-dimensional Bible class. Yes, yes. I, I learned a three-dimensional way to attack the enemy that's been attacking me. I learned a three-dimensional understanding of how to overcome the pressure that's trying to come over me. Sunday morning, I'm going to take you into the next dimension. I'm going to talk about suffering. If you've ever suffered anything, if you've ever been through anything, if you've ever felt like giving up, if you've ever felt like throwing up your hand, you will not want to miss what I'm going to share with you next. In times of trouble, it's really not company that you need. It's sound wisdom. So this is not just about being lonely in times of trouble. This is about getting insight in times of trouble because you're, you're really feeling alone because you're thinking inside of yourself. I do that sometimes, it's like I grew up in West Virginia and your wheels would get on ice and they'd be spinning and rubber would be burning and you're burning gas but you're not getting anywhere. Anytime you think the same thing five times, you're not thinking, you're worrying. Anytime you keep rehearsing the same thing over and over again, what am I going to do about this? Oh, my God, what am I going to do about this? If I don't do something, something's going to happen. Oh, it's coming by Thursday, and I don't know what I'm going to do. See, at first I was thinking, but if I keep repeating it, I'm just worrying. And you're never going to get the answers you need just by worrying.